The article discusses cultivated meat, which is grown in a lab rather than on a farm. It includes opinions from people who find the idea repugnant, as well as those who are excited about the potential benefits. The author also shares their experience trying cultivated chicken at a restaurant. Skewers. Skewers. Marinades. Marinades. Hibachi. Hibachi. Iterations. Iterations. Demographics. Demographics. Salmonella. Salmonella. Avian. Avian. Destabilize. Destabilize. Intensified. Intensified. Mycelium. Mycelium. This message comes from NPR sponsor Penguin Random House with My Father the Panda Killer by Jamie Jo Huang, a new poignant novel told in alternating voices between a teenager in 1999 and her Vietnamese father in 1975. Available wherever books are sold. When I say cultivated meat, what comes to mind? Is it hard to picture? Well, we'll give you a hint. It's not harvested on a farm. It's harvested in a lab. Companies have been working on it for years. And this summer, two of them got the green light to push some of their finished product out the door. In a few years, we might be able to grab it off grocery shelves. Some of you shared what you thought about the idea of cultivated meat. Um, I think this idea of growing meat in a lab is fairly repugnant, personally to me. Yes, so I think that I don't have a problem with lab-grown, I guess, chicken. I am all for growing this stuff in the lab. Uh, Supposedly, it tastes really great. And also, no animals are harmed in the making of this product. I think it's fantastic. I can't wait until I can buy it. Lab-grown food is something that I have no interest in whatsoever. I'd rather do it the traditional way. I... Yeah, lab-grown is a no for me. For now, lab-cultivated chicken is only being sold in two places across the country from the company's Upside Foods and Good Meat, at one restaurant in San Francisco and one restaurant right here in Washington, D.C. One of our WAMU newsroom reporters got the chance to try it, and we'll hear all about it and how it tastes after the break. I'm Jen White. You're listening to the 1A Podcast, where we get to the heart of the story. We'll be back in just a moment. Stay with us. Hey, it's A. Martinez here to tell you about NPR Plus. NPR Plus gives you access to sponsor-free versions of your favorite NPR podcasts, such as Up First, and even special bonus episodes from shows such as Fresh Air and Planet Money. And the best part? It all supports public media. Learn more at plus.npr.org. That's P-L-U-S dot Let's welcome Amanda Michelle Gomez. She covers food and labor for DCist and WAMU. Amanda, welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me. Okay, so cultivated meat isn't broadly available to the public yet, but you were able to try cultivated chicken at Chef Jose Andreas's Washington, D.C. restaurant, China Chilcano. What did it taste like? <laughs> Jen, it tasted like chicken. <laughs> uh, so let me back up. Right, okay. I ate it at Chinan Chilcano. Um, the chef there, Daniel Lugo, told me it would taste like chicken. Of course, I was skeptical. Um, but when it came, um, it was part of a tasting menu. It was the first course, actually. So it came out. Um, it was chicken skewers. Um, it came before me. It looked like Um, a stock image of what it was, um, which is a popular Peruvian uh, street food called anticucho, um, which are skewers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it looked like that. I was like, all right, you know, check one, (laughs) check the first box. It came before me. I took a bite and, I mean, it had that chickeny flavor. My colleagues and I then started to like, you know, take it apart, Uh really trying to find a difference between conventional meat and that's when I, like, noticed that it was very uniform in, in texture. And ex- right. when you say uniform, what do you mean? Sure. Uh, it 
it didn't have that fatty, you know, part of that a chicken might. It didn't have, it wasn't chewy sometimes. It like all tasted pretty consistent, mm. you know? And so that was, that was one of the things that, you know, I, I noticed. Um, and then the other thing was it wasn't as um, packed with a punch of the spices that um, an anticucho skewer would. Um, so anticucho is... Um, like vinegar and spices, and it's usually um, beef marinated overnight okay. with those spices. Um, I spoke with the chef. He said he was, um, it came, the meat uh, from Good Meat came to him uh, pre-cooked. And so, and that's just because that's how the company is only able to send it out to restaurants right now. And it, uh, he, you know, marinated the chicken in um sauces only for a few hours and so you really taste chicken mm-hmm. <laughs> when mm-hmm. you're biting into it right you don't taste all of the the vinegar and spices packed into it um so he marinades it and then he um grills it on, for a few hours and then he grills it on the hibachi grill well, what's the price point for that dish i know this was part of a tasting menu but was it in line with what you'd expect to pay for just you know skewers made out of chicken thighs um so it the tasting menu costs $70 per person, which is, you know, an average tasting menu price here in the district. I mean, that's expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's $70 for four course, uh, five courses. Um, it's now a four course menu. Um, but it, and when I asked uh, Good Meat how much the skewer itself or how much the, how much Good Meat would cost, um, they couldn't give me a price point. Um, they did say that they're not making um, a profit right now um, through the through giving it to restaurants. But why was this restaurant chosen as one of the pilot spots? It's a Jose Andres restaurant, and you know they he has credibility, and they want people to to eat their meat. Um, as you know, listeners heard earlier in the progr- uh, program, people are skeptical, right? Mm-hmm. And Jose Andres has name recognition. He's known um, to be a good chef. Uh, to be experimental. He's also known to be a humanitarian through World Central Kitchen, right? He uh, feeds people in terms when uh, there's environmental crises, right? Just recently uh, in Hawaii. So he's he's known for for that and they wanted him to, to sell it. And he's actually on the board of Good Meat. Um, and he agreed to do that after visiting the facilities, after learning how this was made. Um, and so he wanted first, you know, to know about it. And and also he helped with the, he his team provided culinary expertise. Ah. So they tried it. And this went through several iterations. I, I The chef, uh, Chef Lugo told me, you know, they tried it. First it was, it didn't have the right consistency. It didn't have the right something. Um, and then they finally landed on the one that was on my plate. Um, which, yeah, was pretty remarkable in its resemblance to conventional chicken. Now, a lot of talk around cultivated meat includes whether or not it could help ease carbon emissions. WAMU's environment reporter, Jacob Fenston, looked into this recently. Here he is. So the idea is that, you know, cultivated meat could feed the world with a much smaller carbon footprint, um, largely because, it, you know, we wouldn't need to use so much land. We wouldn't need to be clear-cutting forests, you know, rainforests in the Amazon the problem is this technology is still so new, it's just currently being produced in these very small quantities. We just really don't know the full impact when it is scaled up to, uh, to be mass produced. We'll hear more from the CEOs of two companies on that issue in just a bit. But there are so many questions swirling about what this could look like on a commercial scale. Not everyone is on board with cultivated meat. Amanda, you spoke to D.C. Michelin star vegetarian chef Rob Ruba. Here's what he had to say. I think it detaches us once again from our food source, from the natural world. There's a lot of, I guess, conscious things about it that are very nice, like, oh, we're not harming an animal, we're not doing this. But I I think uh, we just need to be more mindful of how we're eating and what we're doing to the environment. So, Amanda, it doesn't sound like Chef Ruba will cook cultivated Mm -hmm. chicken, but how do his feelings fit in with the broader skepticism around this product? I mean, the public appears to be pretty split on the issue. So I was looking at some polling on this, um, and one from the AP back in February, 50% of people wouldn't, you know, wouldn't try it. Uh, the people that would, uh, who would be likely to try it were young and urbanites, um, which 
you know, seems to kind of maybe reflect the district demographics, mm-hmm. right? Uh, we took our own unscientific poll um, of our Instagram followers and followers and out of like over a thousand people who responded, I mean, 56% said they would at least try it. Um, but I think there are, and as far as, you know, chefs in the district who would who would maybe even cook it, right? Like, are, there, is it, are people even open to cooking with it? Um, and I have been polling chefs in conversations. And, you know, it's also pretty split. Rob Ruba, you know, he said, if you're going to eat chicken, um, he's a vegetarian, but he says, if you're going to eat meat, you know, get it from local farmers, right, who are doing this sustainably and, and cruel-free. Um, and when I spoke to another chef, um, Chef Todd Gray over at Equinox, you know, he said, I'm game, like, I will prepare it. I've pre- I've worked actually with Good Meat in the past. Um, they have another a plant-based egg that he put on and he offered to people. So he was because he was familiar with it. Mm-hmm. He had more. He was more willing to give this this a try. As this product continues to be worked on and potentially scaled up, what are you watching for? What impact do you think it could have on the food scene? Yeah. So I don't. I. It's hard to know right now what's going to happen just because or if it's going to have a big impact just because it's so rare. I asked Good Meat if they plan to expand it beyond this one restaurant. And, you know, they said no, Mm -hmm. not right now. They just can't afford to. Well, we'll hear more on that a little later in the show. That's Amanda Michelle Gomez. She covers food and labor for DCist and WAMU. Amanda, thanks. Thank you. We're going to head to a quick break, but when we return, we speak to the CEOs of the companies that have gotten the green light for their cultivated chicken. We'll hear all about what they're cooking up in just a moment. Stay with us. This message comes from NPR sponsor Shopify. No idea where to sell? Shopify puts you in control of every sales channel. It is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're a garage entrepreneur or IPO ready, Shopify is the only tool you need to start, run, and grow your business without the struggle. Once you've reached your audience, Shopify has the internet's best converting checkout to help you turn them from browsers to buyers. Go to shopify.com slash NPR to take your business to the next level today. Let's get back to the conversation with these messages we got from some of you. I don't have an opinion one way or the other about lab-grown food. I figure that's the wave of the future if we're going to be able to feed the growing population on this planet. I would be willing to try lab-grown food if it tastes good. Well, let's bring in some people who can walk us through how it's made. Josh Tetrick is the CEO of Good Meat. Their cultivated chicken is being served in Washington, D.C. Josh, welcome to 1A. Good to be here. I wish I had some chicken to give you now. <laughs> also with us is Uma Valetti. He's the CEO and founder of Upside Foods. Upside Foods serves their cultivated chicken in San Francisco. Uma, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jen. It's great to be here. So I just want you to walk us through how the meat is actually made and harvested. Josh, I'll start with you. Well, it starts with a cell, and then you identify nutrients to feed the cell. And then you manufacture it in a stainless steel vessel called a bioreactor. And then after about a few weeks, you remove it from the stainless steel vessel and you convert it into the finished product. And it's a way of making meats without tens of billions of animals. It's a way of making meat without a live animal. Um, and it all starts with a cell. Where do those cells come from? You get them from a cell bank, um, from a biopsy of an animal. You can get it from a fresh piece of meat. So all sorts of different sources. How do you know when the product is finished and and ready to harvest? Well, it typically takes about three weeks, at least for a chicken today. So once the cells reach a certain density, um, we we remove it. And then through a process called extrusion, we um, are able to build the the proper texture um, and the the final touches. so it, uh, it's good enough to actually serve at uh, one of Jose Andres' restaurants. Uma, what's the difference between growing chicken as compared to, say, a beef or pork cultivated meat? Uh, it's actually very similar. The cultivated meat, the underlying technology is really powerful because what we are saying is everything we eat is made of cells. 
the piece of steak or chicken breast is made of billions of cells. And that's the building block. So if you take the cell that is the best cell from that animal breed and feed it with the right nutrients in a clean environment, you can get meat that's delicious, flavorful, without having the downsides of raising billions of animals every year or having the environmental impact. Uh, so that's the promise. It can be done for land animals. It can be done for birds. It can be done for seafood. So Josh, you you start with cells. Are you using the same cell line to grow cultivated chicken over and over again, or are you switching out cell lines? We are. It's the same cell line. And it's it's also important as it relates to the regulatory process. So um, when we applied to um, the regulatory authorities in Singapore, where we launched in late 2020, and then when we applied to the FDA and received clearance there, you're applying um, with a cell line. Um, and it's that cell line in the process to scale that particular cell line up that was approved by the FDA. Um, so we can't switch cell lines. Um, and at least right now, that's how the, the regulators are looking at it. So let's say we wanted to use a different cell line from a chicken that's from Patagonia, which I would like to do one day, um, we, would have to, uh, we would have to apply again. So how then do you protect the integrity of the cell line you're using and growing this cultivated chicken? When you say protect the integrity, you mean the, the intellectual property of it? or Not, the, not so much the, the intellectual the pro- pro- property of it, but just ensuring that the cell line is, is safe to continue producing yeah. food. Well, when, when the FDA is looking at this, they're looking at a number of elements related to safety. And at the end of the day, their, their primary question is, is this safe for human consumption? Not, will this make a lot of money? Not, will people like how it tastes? Not, will Jose Andres like it? Uh, so they're looking at the microbiological profile. So think E. coli, salmonella, fecal contamination. They're looking at the stability of the cell, the sterility of the cell. So a lot of different metrics that they're looking at, which are actually all published and publicly available on the FDA website. Uh, and then, at, and for us, at least, after a two-plus-year review, uh, they determined that it is, in fact, safe for human consumption. That eventually led to us saying, all right, now it's time to sell it. Uma, what about for your company? How are you all taking safety into consideration? Uh, it's the table stakes. I mean, nothing starts without safety because, I mean, these are products that have evolved over the last seven years. This industry is still young, and over the last seven years, we've been able to do multiple testings, tastings, and to start with, um, you know, I'm the first person and the first family with my kids eating this on a regular basis for the last several years. And then we go through the FDA process like Josh described. It's a long process. We've been working with them for many years, and you submit a lot of information to them about the the cell line, the feed, the conditions in which the chicken is grown, and then how you handle it throughout the whole process. And that's like hundreds and hundreds of pages of information backed up by thousands and thousands of tests. So I think that's the way to make sure that we compare it with what is currently established as safe. Now, what's currently established as safe has a tremendous amount of downsides. Like when we talk about E. coli, Campylobacter, Salmonella, there is just no way around it. If we keep raising chickens the way we do, we just can decrease that risk. With cultivated meat, you decrease that risk multiple four, multiple magnitudes down. And there's still some residual risks if people don't handle it well, but the risk is completely taken away from the fact that there is no slaughter of an animal and the fecal contamination in the process. And that's the most important thing. And then we do a series of things after that for tasting the flavors to match it as close as possible to what people are used to. And I think we're just getting started. Cultivated meat, this is the opening bell this year for upside as well as good meat. And there's hundreds of companies in the space that have started that are doing innovation to make it substantially better. So I just say we're just beginning. I want to give our audience a little more context about the uh, FDA and USDA's involvement here. So the Food Safety and Inspection Service at the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Food and Drug Administration are working on this together. They agreed to work under a joint framework to oversee lab cultivated food in 2019. So oversight starts with the FDA and then moves 
to the food and safety inspection service during the stage where cells are harvested. You have approval from the food and Sa- the food safety and inspection service, and the FDA raised no questions about the pre-market consultation you had for your products. And that pre-market consultation period is typically a time when a company shares data and safety information about their product with the FDA to ensure it meets regulatory standards. Now, both of you have uh, alluded to the fact that this has been a long process. And both of your companies are only producing this cultivated chicken on a scale large enough to supply each of the restaurants you're working with. Josh, how long has it taken to get to this distribution stage? Yeah, and you're right. This distribution stage is a pretty small distribution stage. So we actually started in uh, Singapore in late 2020, December 2020, uh, when we were uh, the first company in the world to receive approval. And we began selling in very small volumes there. Um, so we've learned a bit from that experience, um, and I think Good Meat, roughly the, the early research started about six and a half, seven years ago, um, and it's really taken all that research and uh, the capital invested in scale up to even get us to this place where we can produce a very, very small amount of volumes for, uh, for Jose Andres' restaurants, but it's got to start somewhere, and, and, and that's, how, uh, that's where it's starting. How, how much of an investment are we talking here, Josh? Give us some sense of the cost of producing to this scale. Well, without saying that the specific cost, I can tell you that our costs are many, many times higher than the conventional cost of chicken, beef, and pork. Um, and the primary reason why, there are a few reasons why, but the primary reason why is we're just making it at such small volumes, right? Imagine that um, we had started a yogurt company, and we were making yogurt in a blender instead of a large um, stainless steel vessel, the kinds of vessels that Danone would uh, use just to sort of exaggerate the example. Our costs would be out of control. So the fact that we're making such small, small volumes today also means that our feed or our media costs are much higher than they need to. Um, so there are a lot of efficiencies that we need to build into this. And ultimately, the goal here is not to just have it on a $70 tasting menu, obviously. Right? Obviously, the goal is to have it so that real chicken, real beef, real pork that didn't need to um, require the slaughter of an animal is um, more cost-effective than all the conventional ways of producing. And that's a... That's a long process, right? Now, our goal is by the end of the decade, but you know, if it takes longer than that, we're here for it. At its current scale, what data do you have about the environmental impact of your product compared to the process of raising and slaughtering animals? Uma, I'll come to you first. Yeah, so what we're doing is at current scale, we're collecting data on the process. And there's a few things to keep in mind. The reason we believe cultivated meat when produced at scale will have a tremendously positive environmental impact rests on the two following principles. One, it takes about two weeks to make meat. Let's compare that with two and a half months for a chicken, nine months for a pig, and two years for a beef cattle. That means we have to feed our animal cells for two weeks versus 10 to 100 to 1,000 times longer. Therefore, less inputs and less inputs mean less environmental impact on growing those inputs that feed the animal cells. And that's one of the biggest fundamental reasons. The second one is when we build cultivated meat production facilities, they do not look like a lab at all, not even now. They look like clean production facilities. When we build these at scale, and as we plug these things into regenerative energy, green green, uh, grid, the impact on the environmental production, whether it's releasing carbon dioxide, just decreases dramatically because you can't plug an animal into an electric grid. They're going to keep releasing methane and carbon dioxide for their lifetime. Cultivated meat production facility at scale on a renewable grid do not have that downside. So those are the two most important principles to keep in mind. And our data that we have so far and lots of peer-reviewed publications so far support that. Josh, for your company, how are you taking the environmental impact of producing this meat? Because it does require quite a bit of energy to do so. How are you taking that into account? Yeah, very similar to the way that Umar described there. I, you know, take a step back and realize that there are just a, a couple fundamental truths. One is that we we'll, we won't have the data we really want until we're at a large scale, right? So until we're actually producing tens of millions of pounds of this, that's really the that's the data that we really want to look at, not the data that we're producing at a small scale. Although it's in it's indicative of what it might look like at a, a larger scale. 
And to Emma's point, there have been a, a number of studies out there that have compared conventional to cultivated large scale using a number of assumptions uh, that shield cultivated will be significantly more efficient from a land, water, carbon emissions perspective. But, but I will say, I think it's important to just rest on the truth that conventional animal production today is really harmful to the environment. About a third of the planet is used today just to plant soy and corn to feed the animals we eat. Think about that. A third of this planet is dedicated not to feeding me and you, but to feeding the animals we eat. And the animals we eat and all that production is responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than all the transportation sources combined. We need a different way of doing it. Um, and we think cultivating meat gives us the highest probability of success. But we'll have to see how it plays out. That was Josh Tetrick. He's the CEO of Good Meat. And Uma Valetti. He's the CEO and founder of Upside Foods. Both of their companies have USDA approval for their cultivated chicken that's now available in limited qualities at Bar Cren in San Francisco and China Chilcano in Washington, D.C. Thank you both for joining us. Coming up, we talk about the impacts cultivated meat could have on the food industry and possibly the climate. Plenty more still ahead. Stay with us. Today, we're diving into the world of meat, cultivated meat. Well, what happens if this industry grows more? Let's bring in two new voices. Holly Wong is a professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. Holly, welcome to the program. Hi. And also with us is Liz Specht. She's the Senior Vice President of Science and Technology at the Good Food Institute. Holly, you studied people's perception of cultivated meat, and we've heard a range of those perspectives today. China and Korea are two of the largest meat importers, and your research included thoughts from people living there. What did you find? Uh, Very interesting. They're also very excited about uh, uh, this new product, um, but slightly different to the consumers in the United States, that these two countries, people are having more emphasis on the plant-based meat, a little bit behind on the cultivated meat. Maybe they are uh, just not aware of that, um, but overall, it's pretty similar to the domestic consumers that most of the people still will stay on conventional livestock, produce the meat. Um, but they're starting to have people more interested in the plant-based meat and sell cultured meat. Liz, if the cultivated meat industry expands, some say it could alleviate some of the carbon emissions that come specifically from factory farming animals for consumption. But what questions remain about the potential environmental benefits or negative impacts of the cultivated meat industry? Yeah, great question. So let's start by zooming out and just talk about what the environmental impact is of the the current conventional animal production industry. Right now, animal agriculture causes about 20% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. That's equivalent to all the planes, trucks, cars, trains, and ships on Earth. So we're talking about a huge fraction of climate that's attributable to the current way we produce meat. Um, As Josh and Uma noted before, of course, the the kind of final numbers for assessing environmental impact of cultivated meat will come in once we're at true manufacturing scale. But there have been a number of environmental studies that have projected out those environmental impacts uh, once the industry is at scale with a number of different sort of process assumptions and scenarios Uh, A recent study that was just published in a peer-reviewed publication, the International Journal of Life Cycle Assessment, in January of this year, found that compared with conventional meat, meat cultivated directly from cells could reduce global warming by up to 92%. Uh, That's for something like beef. The numbers on on pork are around 44% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, And similar um, kind of environmental numbers for carbon for chicken, but with massive benefits across all of those animals for things like land use, water use, environmental pollution, deforestation, biodiversity. So all of the sort of extra externalities from an environmental perspective beyond just looking at greenhouse gas emissions. Well, and, and just practically speaking, Liz, what would that mean for our current climate crisis, that kind of reduction? It's, it's huge. We can't look away from this. So there was a recent study by folks at Oxford University that found that even if fossil fuel emissions were eliminated immediately, 
the world cannot meet its Paris Agreement targets without shifting away from conventional animal agriculture. So this sector is something that absolutely needs to be looked at and is extremely underinvested in terms of all of the financing going into climate innovation and climate technologies. If you look at something like renewable energy, that's been getting literally tr trillions of dollars of both government investment and private sector investment over the last several decades. Compare that to where we're at in, in all of alternative proteins that's gotten, by our estimates, maybe a billion dollars total of government investment over all time. So we've got a huge discrepancy in terms of the, the seriousness with which the climate community and governments um, are, are taking alternative proteins and cultivated meat in particular relative to its potential climate benefits. Another argument in favor of cultivated meat is that it could be a solution to food insecurity. Liz, why do people suggest this could be a way to address hunger and malnutrition? Yeah, so I think the main benefit here really comes from a food system resilience perspective. We've seen lots of increasing pressures on the conventional livestock and poultry industries, things like uh, climate change actually making making those industries um, really threatened and, and uh, causing heat stress and loss of animals and so forth. But also things like biosecurity threats, like we've seen H5N1 avian flu circulating over the last few years that can really destabilize these intensified production systems that involve live animals. And we've seen this cause um, supply chain volatility. We've seen it cause massive price swings in both poultry and in eggs. So if you compare that to a production system that's in this clean, closed, contained environment where you don't have li live animals who are spreading these types of diseases and who are susceptible to these types of, of pressures, um, this really gives us a, a more resilient means of producing the exact same meat end product. Liz, I'm trying to project out um, if they're able to scale up production of this product. Is there any concern that lab cultivated meat, if it becomes cheaper in that production process, that it then pushes conventionally produced meat into sort of a um, into sort of a, a, being a premium product where that that becomes even more sought after because it's not grown in a lab? Does that make sense? I think it'll be a long time before we get to that point. Again, you know, the the global demand and Uma made this point very well for meat is is off the charts. It's higher than it's ever been. It's continuing to increase. The UN FAO predicts that meat production and consumption will increase by more than 50% between now and 2050. So meat consumption is going up. It's going up per capita almost everywhere in the world. And of course, our global population is still rising too. So this is really a matter of how are we producing more meat total? Um, and it's, it's a multi-solution kind of challenge here, right? So we've talked about plant-based being part of the picture as well. Folks are using microbial fermentation and mycelium to produce meat-like meat products. Uh, and this is, is simply another kind of tool in the toolkit for making sure that we can meet that rising global demand. Holly, if the cultivated meat industry continues expanding, what effects do you anticipate it could have on the larger food and farmer, farming industries? Uh, that right now there is some concerns that farmers would think, uh, what about uh, the reduced use uh, feed for our current livestock industry and poultry industry? Um, but I, uh, another research of us showing that uh, even though for the lab cultured meat, there's eventually they still need the nutrition coming, uh, protein intensive nutrition coming from plant based agriculture. So. Um, I, that concern is uh, shouldn't be there uh, at least at current scale. That uh, they're going to use traditional like uh, soybean or other uh, poultry, uh, sorry, and other pulse crops to that that has more protein to feed the industry, so called the uh, sol solution or medium. Uh, as early also another word we heard that called broth. So, so basically that's the nutrition solution that they, they need to grow using in the lab. So uh, for the industry, uh, by and large, our eventually source of energy and source of protein are still coming from plant crops. 
Liz, what are the the big outstanding questions that need to be answered about this industry, not just in terms of whether it can be scaled up, but around questions of its environmental impact, as we heard from um, our two previous guests? There's some things they're just not going to understand until they get this to such a scale that it could be on a grocery a grocery store shelf. I think a lot of of the kind of innovations that are still needed are really kind of process optimizations and refinements. There's there's no sort of um, you know golden technology that's a huge unknown at this point. It really is about scaling and refining and optimizing. And as has come up before, the big question here is really. Can it get to cost parity? If so, when and what does it take to get there? Um, of course, you know, I think it's worth acknowledging that this scaling challenge and cost reduction challenge is not unique to this field by any means. We've seen this with smartphones, solar panels, genome sequencing, many of the most impactful technologies that now shape our lives and we take for granted um, were pretty unimaginable before some key scientific breakthroughs and before they really started to gain scale um, in the private sector. We're going to have to leave it there. That's Liz Spreck. She's a senior vice President of Science and Technology at the Good Food Institute, and Holly Wong, a professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Purdue University. Thanks to you both. Today's producers were Jorgelina Manarea and Barb Anguiano. This program comes to you from WAMU, part of American University in Washington, distributed by NPR. I'm Jen White. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk more soon. This is 1A. Support for this podcast and the following message come from WISE, the account that lets you manage your money internationally. With WISE, you can send, spend, and receive in over 40 different currencies. You always get the mid-market exchange rate with no markups or hidden fees. Simple. Download the WISE app today.